All right, welcome to Chapter 2, Guide to Wireless Communications, 4th Edition, uh, Wireless and Data Transmissions. Uh, any luck, after reading this chapter, you guys are going to be able to discuss the um, uh, two types of wireless transmissions. Uh, we're going to look at the property wave, uh, amplitude, wavelength, frequency, and phase. We're going to outline some basic concept techniques related to the transmission of... Um, of data by radio waves uh, and describe the uh, the main or describe the uh, spread spectrum uh, transmissions and how they how uh, they work with uh, all the different types of um, signals that are being uh, spread throughout. Uh, start off real quick. We're going to look at the wireless signals themselves. Now, what you want to do is you want to consider the cell phone, uh, smartphone, uh, something that you already know, something that you're used to having. Um, if you're if you were to take apart your uh, your phone, you'd find uh, a whole bunch of different pieces: chips, microphones, speakers, resistors, capacitors. You know all the uh, all the parts that make up your phone. Yet much more than just the phone hardware is needed to complete that call. So, some of the other elements involved are the cell towers that we we drive by, um, the equipment that manages your call as you move from one cell to another, and the equipment that the telephone company has at the central office to be able to communicate with all those towers. Uh, moreover, if you're calling someone overseas, there's additional equipment such as satellites, underwater cables that might be used uh, to complete those, those calls. Uh, trying to make sense of this and uh, for modern communications uh, can be con you know considered mind-boggling, uh, to say the least, because um, there's so many different components that we have to discuss. One approach is starting at the bottom and working our way up. Uh, we look at the individual elements of the components that make up our system, how they all tie together, how the system works, and then we'll we'll move on up. Um, we're going to apply different concepts covered uh, in this lesson, uh, the technologies that we looked in the previous chapter, and then also going to be you know you know kind of like foreshadowing things we're going to be looking at in the uh, in the um, the upcoming chapters. The the first thing we want to do is, is you want to use the KISS principle. Let's keep it simple and short. Um, we're going to use the American Standard Code of Information uh, Interchange, or ASCII, uh, which uses 8 bits to represent all the letters of the alphabet, all the numerals, and a bunch of different symbols. Um, we can easily find ASCII tables on the web and showing them hexadecimal number values and all that stuff. Uh, but if you recall that uh, numbers, uh, that all numbers, such as like a street address, or other numbers that are not intended to be used by a computer in calculations are stored as text, like uh, data. <clears throat> in this case, the number is stored in computer's memory or in binary code or ASCII code. We want to take a look at um, different things like uh, the rays and radio waves and gamma rays and stuff. So wireless signals, they're going to use either copper wires or fiber optic cables to send and receive their data. Uh, wireless transmissions, of course, do not use these or any other visible media. Instead, data signals will travel on electromagnetic waves. All, electroma all forms of electromagnetic waves or energy, such as gamma rays and radio waves and even light, all travel through through space in the form of a wave. Uh, the light from a flashlight or the heat from a fire also moves through empty space as waves. Uh, these waves, known as electromagnetic waves or EM waves, don't require any special medium. Okay, just be air or any type of conductor, such as copper wire or optical fiber. Instead, wireless signals travel freely through empty spaces at the speed of light, or about the, uh, the speed of light, at 186,000 miles um, per second. Practically everything on the universe either emits or absorbs electromagnetic uh, radiation. Uh, if we were to take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, you see that it compares each of the properties of electromagnetic radiation, such as 
the length of an electromagnetic wave uh, with the sizes of like common objects and item. Uh, the middle portion of the figure shows the commonly used names for these waves and at the bottom portion shows the range of the frequencies uh, that is like how many waves occur in a particular second uh, along with where these waves usually originate. So for example if the visible light emitted from a light bulb number of waves that occur in one second is higher than 10 to the 13th. Each wave is about the size of a bacteria that is uh, 3.281 times 10 to the negative 60 or uh, a point zero 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 one meter. So what we're going to be talking about here is you're going to learn about the properties of these electromagnetic waves and the significance they all have in wireless data communications. There's two types of, of waves by which wireless data is sent and received. We have infrared waves and we have radio waves. So infrared light for centuries, flashes of light have been used to transmit information. Bonfires set on top of a hill were once used to relay messages. Ocean vessels sent lights from ship to ship or from uh, ship to shore using light. Uh, in 1880, Alexander Graham Bell demonstrated uh, an invention called the uh, photophone, which used light waves to transmit voice information. Transmitting modern computer or network data using light follows the same principle. Uh, because computers and data communications equipment use binary code. And it's easy to transmit information with light because just as binary code might use a one or a zero, a light has only two properties as well. It's either on or it's off. Okay. So what type of light do we should we use to transmit these signals? Well, transmitting data using visible light flashes such as a strobe light, uh, would be un, unreliable because other sources of light could be mistaken for the transmission signal. Uh, or a very bright light can then wash out the light flashes. Uh, in addition, some types of light can be invisible to the human eye and can be blocked by various kinds of obstacles, fog, heavy rain, etc. Visible light is only one type of light. And that's one of the things that we have to talk about when we look at things like um, fiber optics. Now, all different types of light that travel from the sun to the earth make up what we call the light spectrum. And visible light is just a small part of the entire spectrum. Now, some of the other forms of energy on both sides of the visible light portion of the spectrum, uh, it's like ultraviolet rays, are invisible to the human eye. Infrared light, some of which is also invisible, has many of the characteristics that visible light has because it's adjacent to visible light in the light in the light spectrum, but yet it has a much better medium for data transmission because it is less susceptible to interference from other sources of light, except for obviously infrared light itself. Infrared wireless systems require that each device have two components: an emitter which would transmit the signal, and a detector, which would then receive it. Now, the two components are almost always combined into one device. An emitter is usually a laser diode or a light-emitting diode, LED. Infrared wireless systems send data by the intensity of the light wave instead of whether the light signal is on or it's off. So to transmit a one, the emitter increases the intensity of the electrical signal and consequently the intensity of the infrared light, which indicates a pulse of the receiver. Now the detector senses the higher intensity pulse of light and then produces a proportional electrical current, as you can see kind of like what's happening here in the graphic. Now, infrared wireless transmissions can be either directed or they can be diffused. Now, a directed transmission requires that the emitter and the detector be directly aimed at one another, kind of like what you're doing uh, when you are 
pointing your remote control at a television. Okay. Uh, and you, you're hoping that, you know, you don't have anything in between, you know, blocking your light. It, that's your line of sight principle. Okay. The emitter then sends a narrowly focused or thin beam of infrared light. The detector has got a small receiver or viewing area, like a television remote control. Uh, it'll use directed transmission, and it, and and this is the reason that most of us point the remotes at TV sets or other controlled devices. Now, a diffused transmission re relies on reflected light. Uh, with diffused transmissions, emitters have a more wide focused beam. So instead of a narrow beam, for example, the emitter might be pointed at the ceiling of a room. And uh, it, it'll it use the uh, this as the, re the ceiling will be then become what's called a reflection point. So then the, em the emitter will then transmit the infrared signal back down. It'll bounce off the ceiling, bounce off the floor, bounce off another device, and then it'll it'll hit its, its target, uh, the detector. Infrared wireless systems have, have several advantages. Um, infrared light neither interfaces or interferes with other types of communication signals, like your radio signals. It's not affected by other signals except for light. In addition, because infrared light doesn't penetrate walls, the signals are confined to the inside of a room that is surrounded by walls. It makes it impossible for someone else to listen in on a transmitted signal. However, there are several serious limitations to uh, infrared wireless systems. And the first limitation involves the lack of mobility. Uh, Directed infrared wireless systems can use a line of sight principle, which makes it challenging for mobile users because the alignment between the emitter and detector would have to be continually adjusted. <clears throat> the second limitation is the range of coverage. Uh, directed infrared systems, which require line of sight, cannot be placed in an environment where there's a possibility that anything could get in the way of the infrared beam, like someone standing in front of their remote control while you're trying to change the channel. This means that devices using infrared transmissions have to be placed close enough to one another to eliminate the possibility of something moving uh, between them uh, due to the angle uh, of deflection. Diffused infrared can cover a range of about 50 feet or 15 meters. And because diffused infrared requires a reflection point, it can only be used indoors. Uh, which restricts the limit of coverage of range because there's no ceiling outside. Uh, another significant limitation of infrared is the speed of the transmission. Now, diffused infrared can send data at maximum speed to a whopping 4 meg per second, which in reality isn't that horrible. Now, this is because of the wide angle of the beam loses energy as it reflects and spreads around the room. This is called what we call attenuation. Oh, the loss of energy results in a weakening of the signal. The weakening signal cannot be transmitted over long distances, uh, nor does it have enough energy to maintain a high transmission speed, which is why we have lower rate. Infrared also shares the limitations of visible light and heat. So, for example, uh, uh, you cannot penetrate uh, lightweight. Uh, cannot penetrate through most materials like wood or concrete. The heat rays are absorbed by most objects, including human skin. We feel infrared uh, waves as heat. Solid, opaque objects and even dust and humidity, water molecules and atmosphere, uh, can limit the distance that uh, light and infrared waves uh, can, uh, can travel. Now, because of these limitations, infrared wireless systems are generally used in specialized applications such as data transfer between, say, a laptop computer, digital camera, uh, handheld data collection devices, and other similar devices. Uh, in the past, laptop computers were almost always equipped with infrared 
uh, sensors or interfaces, uh, which often made it easy for us to connect to a printer uh, without using cables. Um, for the most part, we very we don't see those uh, interfaces anymore. They're no longer in use. Wireless printer connections are now implemented primarily uh, via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Uh, infra, uh, some specialized wireless local area networks are based on the uh, infrared method of transmitting data signals. Uh, these are used in situations where, let's say, radio signals would interfere with other equipment, such as hospital engineering rooms or operating rooms, or when security is a concern, uh, like maybe in a government or military installation. Uh, is, um, is there a, a wave in electromagnetic spectrum that does not have the distance of and line of sight limitations of infrared? Um, yes. Uh, and those are what we call radio waves. Uh, the secondary means of transmitting a wireless signal is by using these radio waves, um, sometimes called uh, radio telephony. Um, radio waves provide the most common and effective means of a wireless communication today. Uh, to get an idea of how radio waves behave and begin uh, to understand many of the properties, you, I want you to imagine uh, the surface of a smooth pond of water. If you press down on the water uh, with the palm of your hand or throw a rock in the middle of the pond, you'll see a disturbance that will result in a series of continuously expanding circles or ripples. As the water moves up and down, uh, at the point uh, where your hand pushed in where the rock hit, uh, you'll see more, more circles will appear until the water stabilizes and then the waves just stop. Now, as the waves expand away from the point where the water is moving up and down, uh, the energy of the waves is dispersed into growing rings of waves and the waves become smaller. Uh, lower than the waves at the center of the disturbance where the rock or your hand hit the water. Uh, this loss of energy uh, as a result um, is an important concept that we have to talk about later on. Uh, the waves created at, in a pond have a shape that is similar to that of electromagnetic waves. Now, although when you throw a rock uh, in a pond, you can only really um, see what's going on at the top uh, or the high peaks of the waves that were created. In reality, the wave extends below the surface of the water as well. Uh, so as you saw in the graphic previously, uh, represents that the waves in the pond, what they would look like if you could see from the side. Uh, so if you Remember that radio signals travel through empty space or air um, in electromagnetic waves. Infrared visible light from a flashlight, heat from a fire also move through empty space or through the air as at, in the atmosphere as waves. With radio waves, uh, an, electro, an electric current passes through a wire creating a, a magnetic and electro, electronic field in the space around the wire. These fields radiate or move away from the wire and produce electromagnetic waves. These radio waves, like light and heat waves, are electromagnetic waves that occur in, um, in a particular range of frequencies. They move outward, away from the wire, uh, much like the waves you would see when you throw a rock in the pond. Uh, radio waves, however, are free from some of the limitations that affect light and Unlike heat waves, radio waves can travel great distances. They can also penetrate most solid objects with the exception of metallic ones, whereas light waves cannot penetrate opaque or solid objects. Um, we see visible light waves uh, when you illuminate something uh, and we can feel heat waves, but radio waves are invisible. You cannot see, um, feel, touch, or smell radio waves. Uh, radio waves can penetrate most solid objects and they can travel great distances. Um, 
radio waves can be used to transmit data over long distances without the need for wires. Uh, the method by which radio waves transport data involves several different concepts that will help you to like better understand the technologies that we're going to be talking about in later chapters. Um, how interference can affect transmissions about the speed of transmission and reliability issues and how it may be possible to troubleshoot and resolve some of these problems. Understanding how radio waves transmit data will also give you a basis for learning about how more advanced wireless jet data transmission technologies are. Um, we start by discussing the ways that analog and digital data can be transmitted into uh, radio waves. And the two types are uh, analog and digital. Now, the waves are continuous, um, meaning that their up and down movements keep happening so long as there is enough energy in the wave until it attenuates and loses its signal. Uh, the, an analog signal uh, is one which the waves vary continuously. So in other words, the waves have no breaks in them. Uh, as you can see here, this is showing you an analog wave. Audio, video, voice, and even light are all examples of an analog signal. An audio signal that contains a tone or a song uh, is continuously flowing and doesn't start and stop until the tone is turned off or the song is over. Uh, sounds can vary in pitch and in intensity. Uh, now, suppose that instead of throwing a rock in a pond, you would press a, a momentary switch on a flashlight to turn it on and then turn it off. Now, as you were transmitting a message in Morse code, um, and you had the, the clicking sounds, uh, and knowing for a moment that you know the light is a wave and the resulting on-off pattern of light is similar to what we call a digital signal, which is just on or it's off. A digital signal consists of discrete or separate pulses as opposed to an analog signal. Um, which is a continuous wave. Uh, a digital signal has numerous starts and stops on and off, uh, like Morse code, uh, which is a series of dots and a series of dashes. Uh, computers operate using digital signals. Uh, if analog data such as video image or an audio sound needs to be stored on the computer, it must be converted into a digital format. Uh, before it can be stored and then processed and interpreted by your computers. Now to transmit a digital signal over a telephone line or a TV cable, uh, which are analog media and were not designed to carry a purely digital signal, we would have to have something called a modulator demodulator or a modem. Okay. Um, a modem takes a distinct pulse of electricity that make up digital signals from a computer and encodes them into a continuous analog wave to be transmitted. Um, the process of encoding uh, digital signals or bits onto an analog uh, wave is called modulation. The modem at the other end of the connection then reverses the process by receiving an analog signal and demodulates it. The way in which the uh, radio transmission uh, circuit produces analog waves results in a different number of radio waves happening each second. This is a property of radio waves called frequency. Now, this is a number of times a complete wave cycle occurs each second. Each complete wave cycle is composed of one top, which is your positive, your, your peak, and then one bottom which is your negative peak, uh, as you can see illustrated here. Now, although frequency is a measure of the number of complete wave cycles um, that occur in one second, the shorter form, or what we call hertz, is used when referring to the frequency of a wave instead of cycle per second. A radio wave that is 
710,000 hertz means that its frequency is 710,000 cycles every second. Because of the high number of cycles in uh, typical radio waves, metric prefect prefixes are always used when referring to these frequencies. So a kilohertz is a thousand hertz, a megahertz is a million hertz, a gigahertz is a billion hertz. Um, the wave measured at 710,000 hertz is referred to as 710 kilohertz. Now, depending on how many wave cycles happen in one second, um, or frequency, uh, the positive and negative peaks of the waves are going to be closer together or maybe further apart. Uh, this illustrates another property of waves called the wavelength, or the length of a wave. Uh, the length, the wavelength is a distance between any point in one wave cycle and the same point in the next wave cycle, uh, which um, leads us to talk about amplitude. The amplitude is the height of the wave from the starting point of the wave to the maximum height of one of the peaks. So either positive or negative. So here you can see the example of two waves with different frequencies, but they have the same amplitude. The top wave um, has one cycle uh, per second, and the bottom one has three cycles per second. Note how the peaks of the top wave are further apart than the ones at the bottom. But it is important to also notice that both of the lower frequency waves and the higher frequency ones alternate to the same maximum and minimum voltage, which is their amplitude. And that a change in voltage does not create a change in the frequency wave. So as you can see, I had the same distance from this baseline here to the positive, the same distance from the baseline to the negative on both of these. This has three cycles, one, two, three cycles per second. This has one. Okay, one cycle top, one cycle negative. So it's just one cycle. Okay. The amplitude is the same. The amplitude did not determine the frequency. That's what's important to understand here. To transmit information, radio transmitters use what's known as a carrier wave. When you want to listen to a radio station, you tune the receiver to the frequency of the carrier wave. The carrier wave has a, a fixed frequency like 96.9, 94.5, 100.3. Okay. The, carrier, the carrier wave has a fixed frequency and the data to be transmitted is modulated onto it before the signal is transmitted. Uh, in, the next, in the next lesson, we're going to talk more about uh, transmitters and receivers. But before the information is modulated onto the carrier, it is simply nothing more than a continuous wave. And it's a continuous wave of constant amplitude measured in volts and frequency. So the CW or continuous wave is also commonly called as an oscillating signal or what we call a sine wave. A CW carries no useful information by itself. Technically speaking, only after data, uh, such as music, voice, digital signal, is modulated onto a wave, can we correctly refer to it as a carrier. Once again, a carrier or a continuous wave carries no useful information by itself. Only after data, such as music, voice, or digital signal, is modulated onto a wave, can we correctly refer to it as a carrier? As you may know, radio waves are usually transmitted and received using an antenna. An antenna is a length of copper wire or other electrically conductive material with one end free 
and the other end connected to a receiver or a transmitter. When transmitting, the radio waves created by the electro electronic current of the transmitter are fed onto this antenna wire. This sets up an electrical pressure or voltage along the wire, which then causes a small electrical current to flow into the antenna. Because the current is alternating, it flows back and forth in the antenna at the same frequency as the radio waves. When electricity moves back and forth in the antenna, it creates uh, both a magnetic field and an electrical field around the antenna, perpendicular to each other, as you can see in the graphic. Now, the continuous analog electrical pressure in the signal coming out of the transmitter generates more waves, which move away or propagate from the antenna the same way that the water moves away from the point of impact the way like when you throw the rock at the pond or you put your hand in the pond. The result is what we call an electromagnetic wave. Antennas are also used to pick up transmitted radio signals. An extremely small amount of electricity moves back and forth in the receiving antenna um, in response to the radio signal EM wave that's reaching it. This results in a very small amount of current flowing from the antenna into the receiver, which we'll also talk about in the next lesson. Um, the receiver then can demodulate it and then retrieve the data that was encoded onto the wave when it was transmitted. Next thing we need to talk about though is the speed. You see, there's several different terms that are used when referring to the transmission speed of radio waves. The electromagnetic waves themselves travel at the speed of light, roughly 186,000 miles per second. When digital information is transmitted into radio waves, the speed of the transmission, usually known as bits per second, um, since the primary concern is how efficiently the data can be moved from one place to another. Another term used in measuring the speed of radio transmission is called baud. Uh, or baud rate. Now recall that radio transmissions uh, send out a carrier signal and that this signal can then be changed or modulated with some kind of information. The baud or a baud is a change in that signal. And every time the signal changes, as you're gonna, we're going to talk about later, it defines a boundary of a single of a signal unit. Baud rate then refers to the number of signal unit uh, changes per second that are required to represent the number of bits that are being transmitted. The fewer the signal units required per second, the easier it will be to demodulate it and then retrieve the information that was stored in the wave. However, this usually also means that fewer bits can be transmitted every second. So sometimes the terms bits per second and baud rate uh, will be used interchangeably although they are not synonymous. This confusion originated uh, with early computer modems. Uh, the first modems, for example, had speeds of 300, 600, and 1200 baud. Um, these early modems used a simple modulation technique and were capable of transmitting one signal unit per bit uh, transmitted. Therefore, their speeds in bits per second was the same as their baud rate, 300, 600 or 1200. Um, uh, so, for example, to transmit the letter U, which would be a hexadecimal decimal number of 55 or the ASCII of 01010101, um, it would then take eight signal changes uh, to happen, one for each individual bit, because it's 8 bits, 0101001. Thus, the number of bits transmitted per signal unit baud was a one. However, with later modems, it became possible to have a change in, in signal or a baud represent more than one bit. The signal can then be changed by several different ways. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, later on. Um, but here you can see that we have different uh, change representations in combination of bits. So, the letters um, 
in the table are simply used to differentiate between four types of signal changes. Uh, as an example, the most advanced telephone line modems transmit at a maximum of 4,800 baud, which is the maximum number of signal changes that a typical phone line can support. However, because each change represents more than one bit along with compression of the data, the modems can then actually transmit data speeds of up to 336 bits per second, and they can receive up to 256.2k. A single change um, that, that is the change that is made to the signal that represents two bits is known as a die bit. Uh, when a signal change can represent three bits, it's called a tri-bit. If 16 different signal changes were used, then four bits per signal would be done, and that would be a quad bit. That's represented there. Another term used when referring to transmission speed is also called bandwidth. Now, although this term is used to refer to the maximum data transmission capacity of a digital system, it's accurate only when referring to purely digital systems. Strictly speaking, an analog system bandwidth is defined as the range of frequencies uh, that can be transmitted by a particular system or medium. So in simple terms, bandwidth is the difference between the higher frequency and the lower frequency, um, like the human voice, both male and female, falls within the range of 300 and 3400 megahertz. Uh, the difference between the two frequencies um, is uh, 3,400 hertz minus 300 uh, would be your 3,100 hertz, which happens to be the bandwidth of human voice that is transmitted in your standard telephone system today, which is analog. Now, if we recall that the carrier signal sent in the analog uh, radio transmission is your continuous uh, electro electrical signal um, that it carries no information and is uh, more correctly referred to as uh, a continuous wave or CW uh, only after information is added to its modulation should it be called a carrier. So analog modulation is through the representation of analog information by analog signal. There are three basic types of modulation that can be applied to an analog signal to enable it to carry information. The height of the signal, the frequency of the signal, and the relative starting point or phase of the signal. So what we want to do is we want to look at each one of these separately. The first one you want to talk about is your AM or amplitude modulation. Think of your AM radio. The height of the wave before, uh, or the height of the wave known as the amplitude, okay, can be measured in volts or electrical pressure. This is illustrated here uh, with a typical sine wave. Now, the amplitude modulation, the height of the wave, is changed in accordance with the height of another analog signal called the modulating signal. Now, so in this case, in the case of the AM radio station, the modulating signal is the voice of the announcer or the music, which is also the analog signal. The carrier wave's frequency and phase remain constant. The amplitude modulation is used by AM broadcast radio stations because pure AM is very susceptible to interference from outside sources such as lightning, it is not generally used by itself for data transmissions. If you try to think of maybe if you ever were driving and the AM radio was on, maybe you're trying to listen to a sports game or something, and you're going in a rural area where they have a lot of transformers hanging on the poles, your radio station would always get very loud with a loud buzz or static when you went by one of those uh, transformers. Or if you were trying to listen to an AM radio station and during a lightning storm, it would always be cutting in and out on you. 
Now, because pure AM is very susceptible to interference like outside sources, it is not generally used by itself for data transmissions. Uh, here you can see we have, we have a modulating wave, a carrier wave, uh, and the resulting wave form after the modulation process um, on the bottom. Note that the shape of the top of the, modul of the modulated signal is the same as the modulating wave at the bottom. The shape is also the same, but it is inverted or upside down, forming a kind of envelope or channel. In addition, note that there is no change in the frequency of the carrier wave. So you notice here, if I'm modulating signal, okay, and that is what's following this piece here, top and bottom. And then since we inverted it, okay, it, it kind of like encased this, this signal, it cased it all inside, which then made what we call the channel. In addition, note that there is no change in the frequency of the carrier. Okay, the amplitude remained the same. For FM modulation, the number of waves Reformine the number of waves uh, that are occurring during one second undergoes change based on the amplitude of the modulating signal. So while the amplitude and the phase of the carrier remain constant, uh, an FM signal in simple modulating sine wave, uh, which is your top graphic, okay, the bottom portion of the figure shows the resulting of modulating or FM carrier in frequency. Note how the frequency of the modulated wave changes proportionally because of the change in amplitude of the F, of the, uh, the input signal, which then allows the receiver to reproduce the modulating signal with the correct amplitude for the volume of the sound. The rate of change of the modulated signal, the frequency, follows the rate of change of the input. which in turn allows the receiver to reproduce the frequency, pitch or tone, at the, at the output. The last characteristic of the wave also needs to be encoded uh, in the module, uh, also needs to be encoded into the modulated wave is the polarity or the positive or negative of the, uh, of the input signal. This is represented by the change in frequency of the carrier. Now, as you can see, when the polarity of the modulating signal is positive, the frequency of the modulated wave is high. Conversely, when the polarity signal of the modulating signal is low, the frequency of the modulated wave is also low. Like amplitude modulation, Frequency modulation is often used by broadcast radio stations. However, it is not as susceptible to interference from outside sources and is most commonly used to broadcast high fidelity or hi-fi music. In addition, an FM carrier has a wider bandwidth which allows it to carry stereophonic signals. So if we can basically have two separate sound channels, how do you have your left and your right? The next thing we want to talk about is something we call phase modulation. Okay. In contrast to AM, or amplitude modulation, which changes the amplitude of a wave, and FM, which changes the frequency of the wave, phase modulation changes the starting point of the wave uh, relative to or with reference to the starting point of the previous wave cycle. Now, while the amplitude and frequency of the carrier remain constant, phase modulation is not generally used to modulate analog input signals. A signal composed of sine wave, sine waves has a phase associated with it. Now, the phase is measured in what we call degrees. Um, and one complete wave cycle will span 360 degrees. So 
from the starting at zero uh, and then going to up top we have a, goes to 90 then back to the to the baseline we have um, we have hits the 90 less 180 then we go 90 below that takes you to 270 and then 90 back to the baseline would take you back to 360 okay so like from here okay back to mid below and then back to mid okay so you have your reference signal okay there's your 360 degrees uh, the phase change is always measured with a reference to the wave cycle that happened immediately before uh, phase modulation sy um, systems always use the previous wave cycle as the reference signal um, this example shows you four different phase shifts with respect to a, a reference signal uh, shown as the top of the figure. You can see it illustrates just the changes in the phase. Now, which then takes us over to digital modulation. So how can digital data then be transmitted by an analog carrier when the medium used for the transmission cannot be used with digital signals? Simple answer is that it can be done by modulating the analog signal or changing it to represent a one or making it a zero. Modern wireless systems use digital modulation. It's a method of encoding a digital signal onto an analog wave for a transmission over a medium that doesn't support digital signals, which would be the atmosphere. Uh, vacuum with space. Uh, in the analog system, the carrier signal is continuous and amplitude, frequency, and phase changes would occur continuously because the uh, the input or modulating signal is still analog and therefore continuous. However, in a digital system that uses binary, the changes are distinct, which results in one of two states, a one or a zero. It's a constant positive or a constant negative voltage. Um, it's, an, it's an on or an off. So for a computer to be able to understand these digital signals, each bit must have a fixed duration uh, to represent a zero or a one. Uh, otherwise, the computer would not be able to determine when one bit ends and then one bit would then begin. There's four primary advantages of um, digital modulation over analog modulation. Uh, it makes it better use of bandwidth that's available, less power, performs better when the signal experiences uh, interference from other signals because it's easier to determine a zero or a one. Uh, its error correcting techniques are more compatible with other digital sy uh, systems. With digital modulation, as the um, as with analog, there are three basic changes that can be made to the signal to enable it to carry information: the height, the frequency, and your starting point for your phase of the signal. If we go to binary, I want you to recall that with an analog signal, the carrier wave alternates between the positive and the negative in a continuous cycle. That is, it doesn't stop. A binary signal can alternate between positive and zero volts, or between a positive and a negative voltage. Data transmissions are typically sent in bursts or bits. Meaning that some bits are transmitted, then the transmission stops, then more bits are transmitted. Best way uh, to visualize this at, is that digital information sometimes has long strings of zeros and ones. And when there are no bits being transmitted, there's nothing being transmitted at all. In analog, even when a radio station is not transmitting any sound, the carrier wave continues to be transmitted. In this case, your radio receiver simply doesn't detect any modulation of the carrier and therefore doesn't extract the original signal. 
Consequently, the receiver does not reproduce any any sound, even though the signal uh, is still being transmitted and received. There are three basic types of binary signaling methods that are used to represent digital data. One, return to zero, the technique that call, um, calls for the signal to rise, and then which means voltage will increase, then to, that'll be a one, and in this case, a zero is represented by the absence of voltage or zero volts, okay? which is kind of like what we're looking at right here. Okay? In this case, a zero bit is represented by the absence of voltage or zero volts. Okay? Notice that the voltage is reduced to zero before the end of the period for transmitting another one. The signal shape does not quite fill the bit period. This transition of the signal in the middle of a bit period is used to synchronize the transmitter and the receiver. <clears throat> the second method, uh, which is called NRZ or a non-return to zero technique, this non this with non-return to zero, the voltage of the signal does not change for the entire length of the bit period. With the next bit to be transmitted, uh, it has the same binary value as the previous bit. Uh, with the next bit to be transmitted, it has the same binary value as the previous bit. The signal does not change, remaining high for one and low um, for zero. Uh, this effectively reduces the number of uh, signal transmissions or the VOD required to transmit the message. As with a return to zero, there is no voltage when transmitting a zero bit. The final uh, one would be what we call polar non-return to zero. Now, when I mean, we have polar, it's going to be inverse. Okay, so you're going to have your positive and you're going to have your negative. The final method uses a positive voltage to represent a one bit, changes the voltage uh, to a negative rep uh, to represent a zero. This technique is more commonly referred to as a non-return to zero level because the signal never returns to the zero volts level. A variation of the non-return to zero uh, level is the non-return to zero uh, invert uh, on ones or NRZI. It's used to reduce the baud rate required to transmit a digital signal. In the NRZI, the change in voltage level represents a bit, whereas no change in voltage level represents a zero. Why, why are there so many uh, binary signaling methods? Well, there's two reasons. Transmitters and receivers have a tendency to get out of sync with each other. Uh, the uh, transmitter sends a long string of ones or a long string of zeros. The lack of transitions makes it difficult to keep both devices in sync. The transitions act like a clock pulse uh, that helps the two radios stay synchronized. Digital electronic circuits tend to average the level of a signal that, that exhibits a lot of transitions. The result is that more transitions, more transitions the signal has, the greater the tendency of the circuit to average the amplitude of the signal. Lowering it, making it harder for a receiver to detect the voltage change, and then understand it as a zero or a one. So using bipolar signals helps, but does not eliminate the whole the problem completely. So while trying to minimize the number of um, of transitions, we must also have to be concerned with having enough of them to ensure good synchronization uh, between a transmitter and a receiver. And the methods that we talked about are most basic ones that are employed when transmitting at lower speeds. Several more sophisticated and complex methods of transmitting digital signals over wires and cables do exist, but they are beyond what we're going to talk about in this class. Um, in digital modulation, there are three types. 
of changes that can be made to the carrier to enable it to carry information. The height of the signal, which is your amplitude shift key keying, and the frequency of the signal, which is our frequency shift keying, and the relative starting point at the signal, which is your phase. Which brings us to amplitude shift keying, or ASK. It's a binary mod modulation technique, uh, similar to amplitude modulation, uh, in that the height of the carrier signal can be changed to represent a one or a zero. So when a bit, uh, when a one bit and a zero bit are transmitted, as with amplitude modulation, the ASK employs the NRZ encoding did not return to zero. The presence of the carrier signal uh, represents a one bit positive uh, uh, voltage, whereas the absence of a carrier signal represents a zero bit positive voltage. The signals for transmission uh, using digital binary modulation uh, are shown as the sine waves because wireless transmissions use a medium or electronic waves that can only support analog signal. Remember that the direct transmission of purely digital signals can only be done using a medium that conducts electricity such as copper wiring. Transmitting an ASK uh, is not common because the presence of an interference signal when there's no carrier being transmitted, could be then be mis misinterpreted by the receiver as a bit with a value of one. So ASK systems typically use two amplitude levels, so there will always be a carrier wave present, making it easier for the receiver to differentiate between the two, the two bits, or the two bit value. The absence of a carrier needs to be understood by the receiver as no data being transmitted at all. Then we have FSK, which is our frequency shift keying. Similar to frequency modulation, frequency shift keying is a binary modulation technique that changes the frequency of the carrier signal to represent a different bit value. Because it is sending a uh, binary signal, the carrier signal does not start and stop when the data transmission stops. As an example, when using FSK, more wave signals are needed to represent a one bit, and respectively, Fewer represent zero. Phase key shifting or phase shift keying uh, is a binary modulation technique similar to phase modulation in which the transmitter varies the starting point of the wave. The difference between PSK and, uh, and phase. Uh, PSK and phase modulation is that the PSK transmission starts and stops uh, because the signal being coded uh, onto it is binary. Now, what you want to understand or notice um, that whenever a bit being transmitted changes from a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to a 1, the the uh, starting point, okay, the direction of the wave, would then change. So, for example, after the first zero bit is represented by a normal carrier wave signal, the next bit is a one bit. However, instead of, of this being indicated by another normal carrier wave signal, in which signal is not uh, signal goes into the positive range, meaning goes up in the sine wave, it starts by going in the negative range. The change in the starting point going down instead of up represents a change in the bit going from a 1 to a 0. Uh, so in this example, the change in the starting point of the uh, wave means that the wave will start moving in the opposite direction. So in this case, 180 degrees from the original direction. Note that uh, phase modulation can change the, uh, the starting point at various points or even angles um, of up to 180 degrees from the original direction. 
radio signal transmissions are, by nature, narrowband transmissions. This means that each signal transmits on one radio frequency or on a very narrow range of frequencies. An FM broadcast radio station, for example, would require you to tune the receiver to 90.3 megahertz because this is the frequency in which it transmits. The next lower frequency that listeners will be able to tune into is 90.1 and 90.5 would be the station with the next higher frequency. This ensures that the station at 93 can broadcast roughly between 90.2 and 90.4 without interfering with other stations. The actual bandwidth used by FM stations is less than the difference between 90.2 and 90.4 allowing for some unused frequency space between the highest frequency and the, and the next lower frequency, uh, the station that you're tuned into. Now band transmissions are vulnerable to outside interference from another signal. Another signal that may be transmitted at or near the broadcast frequency, 90.3 in this case. So it can easily render the radio station, the radio signal, um, inoperable or make it difficult to detect and decode the information uh, contained in the signal. So as an alternative to narrowband transmission, what we have is called sp uh, spread spectrum transmission. Now, this is a technique that takes a narrowband signal, spreads it, spreads it over a wide range of frequencies. Um, Spread spectrum, spread spectrum transmissions are more resistant to outside interference because any noise is likely to affect only a small portion of the signal instead of the entire signal itself. Uh, as an analogy, um, Although an accident is, is in one lane of an eight-lane highway, slows down traffic, um, and is inconvenient, there are still seven other lanes the traffic can, can then use. Likewise, spread spectrum is more resistant to interference, and consequently spread spectrum uh, experiences fewer errors due to interference. Uh, two common methods used in spread spectrum frequencies are frequency hopping and direct sequence. Uh, instead of transmitting on just one frequency, uh, frequency hopping spread spectrum uses a range of frequencies that changes the frequency of the carrier several times during the transmission. So with FHSS, a short burst of data is transmitted in one frequency, and another short burst is transmitted in another frequency, and so on until that transmission is completed. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it shows how FS, um, it shows how, um, let me make sure I got the right one here, guys. No, this one. Okay. This one shows uh, how frequency. Uh, uh, or FHSS frequency hopping spread spectrum transmission starts by setting a burst of data at a 244 gigahertz frequency for one millisecond. Then the transmission switches to 241 and then transmits to the next millisecond for the next millisecond. During the third millisecond, the, uh, the transmission takes place at 242. This continual switching of frequencies takes place until the entire transmission is complete. The sequence of changing the frequencies is called a hopping code. So in this example, uh, the hopping code is 244 uh, for two four is uh, is 244, 241, 242, 240, 243. The receiving station must also know and follow the same hopping code in order to completely receive the transmission. The hopping codes are predefined and are usually part of the, of the standard that defines how the current radio circuit will be designed and, and then implemented. Hopping codes can change so that the so multiple radios um, can each use a different sequence of frequencies within the same area and then never interfere with one another. But the transmitter and receiver 
had to agree beforehand uh, on which sequence that they're going to use. So an analogy of how a, uh, FHSS works, imagine that you need a friend, you and a friend both speak five languages, and you want to have a conversation that would be difficult for other people around you to understand, uh, since they, they do not speak the same languages, except possibly maybe one of them. You agree before starting a conversation that you will use a particular uh, sequence of languages, and you will speak each one of them for a few words at a time. However difficult this may be to do, it would certainly accomplish your goal of not allowing anyone to anyone else to understand your conversation. Now, interference, if interference is, is encountered while transmitting with FASS on a particular frequency, only a small part of that message would then be lost. So, like. For here, we got an example of, um, in which the second transmission has been affected by interference. Each block of data transmitted in FHSS is only about 400 bytes long. Typically, FHSS systems can detect errors at the lower protocol layers and then request retransmission before passing the data onto the higher layer protocols. The transmitter and the receiver then would swap the roles with each change of frequency, meaning the transmitter becomes a receiver and, and vice versa. Uh, when an error is detected by the receiver, it forms a transmitter during the next slot when it transmits back to the original transmitter. The original transmitter will then retransmit the same data that was received in error uh, when the switch switches roll again until you until, uh, using the next frequency that came along in the hop sequence. The next you want to talk about is direct sequence uh, spread spectrum. Now, this uses an expanded redundant code to transmit each data bit and then a modulation technique, such as a, quarant, uh, a quadru quadrature phase shifting keying, or QPSK. Uh, this means that the direct uh, spread spectrum sequence signal is effectively modulated twice. First step before, uh, at the top of, at the top here, okay, uh, at the top of the figure are two original data bits uh, to be transmitted as a zero and a one. Now instead of simply encoding these two bits over a carrier wave for transmission, the value of each data bit is then first added to each individual one and zero in a sequence of binary digits called Barker code or chipping code. Um, it's a particular sequence of ones and zeros that have properties that make it ideal for modulating the radio wave, as well as for being detected correctly by the receiver. The ones and zeros are called chips instead of bits to avoid confusing them with the actual data bits. The chipping code is sometimes called a uh, pseudo-random code because it usually, it's usually derived from a number of mathematical calculations as well as through practical experimentation. Uh, result of the addition is the actual set of ones and zeros, or the chips, that would be modulated over a carrier wave. Um, so if we were to take a, another look at it, uh, if we were to if you were to go to your books, you would see the, the um, in the figure 232, um, the bits being transmitted is a 1. And then it's just a series of 1s. And then you add the Barker code, which is 10110111000. Then you bring all that together, and the, the resulting um, sequence of chips are 0100. Um, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, and let's see if we have a graphic of that. We do not. No. Let's go back. Okay. So if a 0 data bit is transmitted, then a 0 is added to each bit of the chipping code. Is what ends up happening. So the original bit was a 0 or a 1. We, we added if a 
if a zero data bit is transmitted, then a zero is added to each bit in the chip encoder, as opposed to the one. I get it. Okay. So instead of transmitting a single one or a zero, in DSSS systems, they transmit a combination of chips. So the 11 chips are transmitted at a rate of 11 times faster than the data rate. So in other words, the data rate doesn't change. However, the result of the transmitting, the result of transmitting at a higher rate is the spreading of the signal over a much wider bandwidth than that of the frequency channel being used. So in the case of Wi-Fi, to continue with the, the early example, the signal is spread um, 11 megahertz to each side of the center of the frequency. And then ends up occupying a total of 22 megahertz, which is what we're kind of looking at here. Before we spread spectrum, okay, and then after we spread it. So there was our middle, and then we went to each side. The spread signal has three important characteristics. The frequency of the signal's digital component, or the chipping rate, is much higher than the original data. The plot of the signal's frequency spectrum looks similar to random noise to narrow band receivers. All the information contained in the original, zero or a one, is still there. The most important aspect of this is not the spreading of the signal, but the fact that the power level of the amplitude at any given frequency has dropped significantly as a result of spreading by using the chipping code at a higher rate. So in similar fashion to FHSS and DSSS, um, a DSS signal appears to be in an unintended narrowband receiver to be low power noise, which is one major advantage of the method of the transmission. Another advantage of using the DSSS, which is the chip encode, is, is that it's conventional narrowband transmission. Um, any interference, even if it's caused the low loss of one bit could require the entire message to be resent, which takes time. In DSSS, if there is any noise or other type of narrowband interference that may cause some of the chips to change value, the receiver can employ statistical calculations, mathematical algorithms that are used to recover the original data bit, thus avoiding the need to have to retransmit. Devices that use DSSS are typically higher end products because they are more expensive to manufacture than the frequency hopping systems. But they also have many disadvantages over the frequency hopping spread spectrum. As previously described, Wi Fi wireless LANs use DSSS along with products that interconnect networks located in several buildings that comprise a campus setting, such as a school, large corporation manufacturing plans, convention center, etc. The frequency hopping spread spectrum and uh, DSSS are not the only transmission techniques used for spread, spread spectrum transmissions. There are other techniques that are even more resistant to interference and to different kinds of phenomena that can cause data loss or reduce the performance of this type of wireless transmission. Some of the techniques are based on variations of DSSS. Others are completely different. Um, later on, we'll have other lessons that will, that will talk about uh, more sophisticated techniques, uh, as well as the types of problems that can affect other uh, types of wireless transmissions. That concludes our um, our lesson today. Uh, I will see you guys back here uh, for chapter three. Uh, we will have uh, some labs.
to uh, to work on together um, for this uh, to reinforce this chapter. And until then, have a good day.